Dougie. Uh, you all got a highlighter down there on your seat. I'm sorry if you have kids in the room because I just gave you a permanent marker for them to look at and play with. And I'm also the family pastor. Hey, how about that? I do wise things <laughs> for uh, families. Uh, I love doing it. I love being your family pastor here and serving the Lord uh, in, with you guys. Uh, I also love a good tracking email, notification email. You know, you get these a lot during Christmas where you get something shipped and they tell you, hey, it's on the way. And I got one this week that said the wait is almost over. And I'm like, great, this is awesome. And I got a little too excited, thought it was coming that day, and it wasn't. It was a bummer. But then I went to back to that email more often than I probably should have. That is probably uh, feasible for somebody. And I got to see things that blessed my, my soul, like the fact that my package went through Kansas City Hub. Hallelujah. That blessed my day. Thank you, Jesus. Uh, I'm totally joking. Those things are not great. But I love it when I get those three words of uh, out for delivery show up. And I'm like, yes, finally, the wait is over, actually over. It's come to my house. Uh, and so when we wait, uh, as we're talking about during Advent and this series, um, we wait for something. We wait for something, and in Advent season, we wait for, uh, and we remember and we rehearse the same thing the Old Testament saints did, where they waited 400 years for the Messiah to come. We remember that, we rehearse it in our minds and our hearts, and we wait with expectation. We still wait with expectation, and I think we understand this a lot during Christmas, and we use sight language for this, where we say we're looking forward to something. We're using our eyes to look, like I'm looking out at the mailbox, seeing when the package is going to come. Or I'm looking to the skies to see when Jesus is going to come back, and I'm looking forward to something that I am waiting for and waiting for it to happen. And this is true of the Bible when it talks about waiting in the Bible. It uses sight language. Our minds and are, are not neutral in all this, where we have an expectant and hope-filled waiting. Our literal eyes and the eyes of our internal selves, our heart, mind, and spirit, are all eagerly searching for some evidence of what we're waiting for in Scripture. Last week, Zechariah, uh, we saw in his story how waiting in silence is a good thing for us, to slow ourselves down, to get quiet before the Lord, and to wait for him to speak to us, for the Holy Spirit to move, for him to give us a word, and for his presence uh, to grow our trust in him. And uh, this was a good thing. This silence is a good thing. And I think we talk some, uh, I don't talk as much at home when my wife's like, how was work that day? And I give her very few answers. And I wonder if she thinks I saw an angel like Zechariah did. And I did not. That has never happened uh, to me. But my wife might think so. And I think our story today uh, gives us a little direction on where we put our waiting, what our expectation is for, what we're waiting for, where to direct our gaze. So let's check out our story today. It comes in Luke chapter 2. Turn there with me if you can uh, with a Bible app or a paper Bible you got. Let's read Luke 2 verse 22. And when the time came for their purification, this is Mary, Joseph, and Jesus, for their purification according to the law of Moses, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every male who first opens a womb shall be called holy to the Lord. And to offer sacrifices according to what is said in the law of the Lord, that they would offer a pair of turtle doves and two young pigeons. Okay, that's fancy. Luke knows his Old Testament. And Mary and Joseph were being good Jewish parents, doing all the things the law requires. Going to the temple for a ceremonial, customary practice after having a kid, especially a firstborn baby boy. And this sets the stage for Luke to actually shift our view to a new person. So let's keep reading. Luke 2, 25. Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and this man was righteous and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. Kind of like Zechariah, Luke has a new person for us to meet and tells us what we need to know about this one. And Doug did a little helpful thing last week and put up a profile for Zechariah, and I think it'll help uh, us with Simeon. And so his name is Simeon. Easy enough, no mention of family or tribe. Status, who, who is this guy? Well, he's a man in Jerusalem. Literally says that, a man in Jerusalem, just a guy. Jerusalem's population at this point was about the same as the Council Bluffs Omaha Metro, like pushing a million people. And he's one of them. Super specific. Thanks, Luke. 
job, we have no idea. He's not, doesn't say he's a priest. We have no idea. We'd be guessing at this point. So we'll skip that one. It's a pretty slim profile so far. What's his age, though? Well, we don't know that either. Though nearly everywhere we look, uh, the guess is that he's older. He's graying because he's waiting his entire life for uh, him to see the Lord's Christ. But let's stick with the Bible here. We don't know his age. He's just not dead yet. The Spirit still has work for him, or still is working in his life, so he's not dead yet. And here's the meat of his profile. Spiritually, this guy has things going for him. He is righteous, meaning uh, his standing before God is in the right. His conscience is clean, he confesses sin, and he pursues goodness. He's devout, he's consistent in his practices of worship. He reveres the Lord, fears him, respects him, and it shows in his life. He's also full of the Spirit. Now, this is rare. Because the Holy Spirit has not dropped yet like in Acts. And the, and the Lord hasn't spoken through prophets and through Scripture for a long time, for 400 years. And the Holy Spirit speaks to this guy. God has been pretty quiet, and he still speaks, but he's to this guy. So that's pretty special. What's he waiting for? He's waiting for the consolation of Israel, the Lord's Christ. Now, where does that come from? Because that's a little weird. Well, Simeon knows his Isaiah, chapters 40 through 66, the whole last section of Isaiah. It's about, I marked it in my Bible, it's about 100 pages back there. It's a lot. There's a lot going on. And he knows it because the themes of what he says and how Luke talks about him show it. So like this one, he's waiting for the consolation of Israel, the comfort of Israel, and the idea of comfort is throughout that whole section of Scripture. And it starts, that whole section... Like this, in chapter 40, verse 1. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. And that starts the ball rolling of what the Lord's comfort is going to look like, how the prophet is supposed to proclaim it, and who brings it. Because this verse, or this comfort, it comes from the Lord's Christ. And we see that in Isaiah 61, verses 1 and 2. It reads like this. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. The Christ means anointed one has anointed me to bring the good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all who mourn. That theme of comfort from the Lord's Christ is throughout that section. And the anointed one would come and bring this comfort and consolation. And Jesus quotes these exact verses just two chapters later. He's looking for Jesus. But he doesn't know the name or all the specifics yet. And all that to say, Simeon is waiting. His expectation is towards something. The eyes of his heart and his head are literally looking for biblical promises to come true. And the Holy Spirit has put a guarantee on it that he won't die until he sees this. He won't experience death. He won't uh, feel his body breaking down. He won't see his body fail before he sees the Lord's Christ. Before he experiences his presence, the Lord's Christ's presence and his goodness. Simeon knows what he's waiting for, and it's not death. His eyes are directed at nothing less than fulfilled promises of Scripture and God's hand to bring him about. And I know as we talk about waiting and we wait for something, I think this passage helps us put our gaze, set our direction of what we're waiting for in the right place. So while we wait, we set our eyes toward God and his work. While we wait, we set our eyes towards God and his work. We wait to see things from God. We wait for him to act. We wait and expect wonderful things from him. We want his presence, his love, his goodness. We want that to be expressed in our lives and the lives of others. We want to see some divine stuff. We want to see the heavens opened. We want to see impossible things happen. And Luke even says as such that with God, nothing is impossible a uh, chapter before. So too, while we wait, let's set our expectation on God and what he does and what he uh, says he'll do. Let's wait for God himself to work and to see it with our physical eyes and to see it with the eyes of our heart and mind and spirit. And we'll look ultimately for his return, but he's working now too. This is big stuff. And sometimes I think when we wait, we wait for things too small. Things that aren't as big as God is, as good as God is. I've done this before. Uh, like in high school, I couldn't wait to get on to college. 
I wanted to get out of there. That was the desire of my eyes, was the next stage in life. That desire was too small. What I could have been waiting for was that God to show up in my high school, for God to show up in my life, for God to do work then and there, but I was totally oblivious to it. I was looking ahead to just the next uh, season of life. I look forward to getting out of the drama, getting out of the paperwork and busy work of high school and getting into maturity because, you know, everybody in college is super mature and it works out that way. <laughs> it's not true. I aimed too small when I could have asked God and prayed for him to show up. I could have set my eyes on him and what he's doing. I think we aim too small. We usually can tell we aim too small when it's only a circumstantial change that we're praying for when it's only that. And that's okay to pray for. We pray for relational struggles to, to subside, for there to be peace in a relationship. But sometimes we set our eyes. What I want us to do is set our eyes on God. We want to pray for that relationship? Sure. Pray for God to show up. Pray for his peace to come. Pray for the God of reconciliation to reconcile that relationship. We set our gaze to him. It makes, us, makes him the focus of our waiting. Or in finances where things aren't going to add up, ends are not going to meet, and we pray for that. That is fine. That is a good thing. But let's set our eyes on him. God, what are you doing here? God, would you show yourself mighty? Would you show yourself and give me wisdom? Would you give me your uh, provision and your generosity? Let me see you in this, this circumstance. And when we set our expectation on the Lord and him and for him to work, the waiting is worth it. It'll make those silent and still moments worth it. Because when we, it's the Lord we're waiting for, and his action and his goodness and his presence, we can be still. When it's his voice we want to speak, we can be silent. When it's his salvation that we cannot do for ourselves, we can wait, quiet ourselves before him and wait for him to act, because only he brings salvation. And it means as we go about our days looking and having our eyes set on him, we can look for his gloriousness, his, his work, his presence. We look for him. Practically, what am I telling you to do? What I'm telling you to do is pick a Bible verse, just one, that talks about the Lord and his work for a situation you're working on, that you're going through, where it's not just the circumstance you want changed, but it's how the Lord will show up and how he'll work. It'll set your prayer, your ex expectation for waiting on him and not just for the change. And before we all pick, ask and you shall not receive, let's get some context for the verse, right? We need to, little, to understand the verse rightly. And before none of us pick anything about being patient, let's, let's pick something that talks about the Lord. So for example, uh, as I was learning about biblical waiting uh, a few years back, uh, one of the verses in Psalm 27 comes to mind. And it reads like this, Psalm 27, 4, David says, one thing I've asked of the Lord that I will seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and inquire in his temple. That helped me to go from, Lord, I want to understand this concept of biblical waiting, to now my eyes were set on him. I want to dwell in your house. I want to be in your presence. I want to see your beauty. It changed it from a situation, a circumstance that I wanted to change to him. I wanted to see at work in my life. It helped me move from praying something like, I want to be closer to you, to setting my ex expectation more clearly on him and his presence and how good he is and how he's beautiful. Or maybe you, are, you have a situation that you're working on that you're going through and that you're waiting for something to happen with. Ask somebody to help you find a Bible verse that you can pray into for that situation that sets your gaze not on just the change, but on the Lord himself. Ask your city group leaders, ask your pastors, me, Doug, or Eric, or anybody on staff, and we can help you find a verse. Say, Nick, I'm going through this. Is there a Bible verse that'll set my eyes on what the Lord is doing in it and how he might work? I love that question. I love it when people ask me that. I even prayed for you guys this week as I was going through this sermon and preparing this. I prayed a Bible verse for you guys from Isaiah 64, 4 through 5. I'll read it for you. From, from of old, no one has heard nor perceived by ear. No, I has seen a God besides you who acts for those who wait for him. You meet him. 
who joyfully works righteousness, those who remember you in your ways. That's been my prayer for you guys. Because I would love it if each and every one of you set your expectation on him, waited for him, and like this Bible verse says, we have not seen a God besides our God that works for those who wait on him. I've been praying that for you. So pick a Bible verse for your situation, set your eyes on the Lord, and, uh, and put our expectation where it belongs and where it's right. So while we wait, let's set our gaze at God and his work. Uh, Simeon shows us some more stuff. Simeon shows us what happens when we get glimpses uh, of how God is working. So let's keep reading. Luke sets the stage again in Luke 2, 27. Let's read. And he came in spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed God. Now pause there. Let's get a picture of this. Simeon, Simeon heads to the temple because the Holy Spirit is telling him. And he sees a couple things. This ceremony that they're going to involves two sacrifices. One is a burnt offering. So fire, wood is burning over on one side. This also involves a sin offering, which includes boiling water, where there's a fire and some boiling water on, uh, on another side. And Simeon, knowing his Isaiah 40 through 66, might remember this verse in 64, Isaiah 64, uh, verses 1 and 2. Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down, that the mountains might quake at your presence, as when fi fire kindles some brushwood and fire causes water to boil. Hmm. Simeon's seeing some of this happen. And then he sees a baby boy in his mother's arms. And I would guess Isaiah 66, 13 pops in his head. And it reads like this, As one whom his mother comforts, so I will comfort you. You shall be comforted in Jerusalem. And in some way, between the Holy Spirit and the scripture that he knows that Luke is trying to show us, this guy in Jerusalem, Simeon, sees the Lord's Christ. Only it's not a mighty king, it's not a ruler coming in to take over, it's not an idea or a feeling or anything like that. It's a baby boy. It's baby Jesus that he sees. And Simeon picks him up, and hopefully he asks Mary and Joseph that, to, to be able to pick him up, like lets them say no, but he picks up baby Jesus, and he can die in peace now. And then he blesses the Lord and says this, Luke 2, 28. He took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation that you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light of revelation to the Gentiles, and for glory to your people Israel. He keeps going. And his father and mother marveled at what was said about him. And Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rising of many in Israel, and for a sign that is opposed, and a sword will pierce through your own soul also, so that thoughts from many hearts might be revealed. I think Anna, our CLK curriculum coordinator, gets a feeling for what just happened every time she comes in the office with her six-year-old baby boy, James. Uh, she comes in for a staff meeting, and we all freak out. We're like, James is here, and we want to hold him, we want to look at him, we start talking to him like he's a real person, understands what we're saying, and we have nicknames for him, and they just start going. I won't tell you the nicknames. She does not want people to remember those nicknames. She doesn't want those to stick, so I'll skip over that. But we get excited, James is here, and then all of a sudden we're like, oh, hey, Anna's here too. Hey, Anna, good seeing you. But James, he just drooled, and it's hilarious and so cute. We get crazy because James walked in the room. And Simeon has waited for this moment for him. Baby Jesus walks in the room. He sees who this guy is, who this baby is, and says, this is the Lord's Christ, and he gets excited for it. And he speaks up. He starts blessing. He starts not dropping nicknames. He starts dropping Jesus' titles and his names, like Jesus' profile. Jesus is the consolation of Israel and the Lord's Christ. He's also salvation. Salvation is so connected to who Jesus is and what he does that salvation is him. Salvation is a person. It's Jesus. He is the light of revelation to the Gentiles or people who do not know the one true God will know him because of Jesus. He's the glory for his people Israel or that the Lord's people, the people that believe the gospel, would go one degree of glory to another in his goodness and righteousness to get experience the glory of the Lord all because of who Jesus is. Simeon talks up Jesus for all to hear. 
And then he turns to Mary and Joseph and gives them a word too. He says that Jesus is a sign opposed. You can't meet Jesus without something changing. You can't meet Jesus and be the same. Fall or rise, the thoughts of your heart revealed. When you meet Jesus, something has to change. And eventually we'll see an empty bloodstained cross, an empty tomb, and a risen Jesus. And we'll have to change. It's a sign opposed. It'll reveal something about us. Something has to give when we see Jesus. So what's Simeon doing? His eyes have looked for the Lord's Christ, and he's seen it, and now he's saying something. Simeon's name even means sign in Greek, and he's a sign, he's a pointer to who Jesus is and what God is doing. And the words that he saw in the scroll in the last part of Isaiah are made flesh right there before him in a baby boy. And there's something for us here. So while we wait, we direct all eyes to Jesus. While we wait for the Lord and the Holy Spirit will lead us where we need to go to see what we need to see, we'll see Jesus at work. And sometimes when we see Jesus at work, it'll be an answer to the prayer that we have been praying. He'll use the Holy Spirit and the scripture that we're praying through to show us, this is how I've worked. This is how my presence is being shown to you. Sometimes it won't be a full answer. Sometimes it'll be a step towards uh, the thing you've been praying for or the thing we've been waiting for, for God himself to show up. Like, even baby Jesus didn't fully uh, fulfill the promises made in Isaiah 40 through 66. But it was a step. It was a wonderful, glorious step that needs to be proclaimed to the world. So while we wait for the Lord, we're going to see people experience the light of revelation and come to know who the one true God is and to see Jesus as God incarnate and put their faith in him. Or we'll see ourselves and others go from one degree of glory to another as he works in us, as he shows us his glory and helps us uh, in, in that too. So let's point him out. That is why I gave you a highlighter in your chair uh, for all of you, that's uh, for you to take home. Because what do we do? We highlight when we see Jesus. Because highlighters take words on a page that we see that are important. Words on a page that we need to remember, that we need to see, that we need to show other people and highlights them, makes them pop, makes them stand out to our eyes. Where we highlight things and we say, look, this is big, this is important. Look at this, remember this. And Jesus is the word that has become flesh. He's God incarnate, author and perfecter of our faith. Isaiah 40 through 66 as a human. So let's highlight when we see him at work. Let's say something when he, his presence shows up and we see it. We see his work in our lives and other people's lives. And we say something. But I think somehow, some way, we miss sometimes what the Lord is doing. Because sometimes it's big and we all can see it. We have baptisms on stage and somebody comes to faith in Christ and we go nuts. But God is at work all the times. And sometimes it's in little things in life. Little things that he is powerfully working in. So don't miss how the encouragement of a brother or sister in Christ is a powerful act of the Spirit to bring life to your soul. Don't miss how the generosity of a friend helps us experience the generosity of God himself. He's showing up. He's at work through that. Don't miss those smaller moments. Highlight them. Show them how Jesus works. Say something that this is Christ. This is God at work among us. So that even in silence and solitude, as we wait and trust the Lord and hear to hear from the Spirit and see stuff in Scripture. That is nothing less when we're in that moment and see that happening. That is nothing less than God at work in and among us to be present with us. We say something. We highlight. I saw this happen about a month back. Uh, I have a college student named Lennon, and he's growing in his faith. He's doing a great job, and he came up to me after uh, our college group one night after I, I had taught and I had mentioned a chapter in Job, and he said, Nick this is crazy. The Lord, the Holy Spirit, led me to read Job this morning. And I'm thinking like, oh no, that's a, that's a terrible, <laughs> like that's a hard book. What is going on here? And he says, no. I read Job that morning. And then later that day, one of my friends was having a problem. And I remembered something from Job and I told her and it helped. Isn't that nuts? Isn't that crazy? I'm like, Len is highlighting Jesus and just not getting it out there quite yet. And so I'm like, I'll highlight that even more. I'm like, Lennon, that is Jesus at work in and among you, in her life, in your life, in my life, to even see it. That is God working. I didn't say all this. It's God working as providence 
in them, his goodness and faithfulness to, to all involved. And to me involved because it gave me this example for this sermon that I didn't know I was going to preach. And so thank you, Jesus. He's at work among us, and we highlight him, highlight him when we see him work. And so when a kid remembers a Bible verse at home, in your home, or down the hall in CLK, that's Jesus at work. That's the Holy Spirit bringing Bible verses out of those kids. Or when we see somebody struggling and we're helping somebody through a sin struggle or just a problem in their life, and we see good desires, good, holy, righteous desires, and they want it, and they want those desires to come to be. We highlight it. That is the Lord at work in you to change your desires, even in this struggle. Or sometimes we just don't know if it's the Lord or not. It seems like it, and it is a good thing to highlight Jesus and say, I don't know, but this sounds like the Lord. Because even that question being put out there puts our eyes on Jesus and what he's doing in our lives and the lives of other people. So while we wait, let's set our expectations on God and his work. Because we wait for the things that he does. We wait for him, his person, his presence to be among us. So let's find a scripture that helps us do that. In whatever season we're in, let's find a scripture that helps us do that. And then while we wait, we direct all eyes to Jesus. When we see him work, when we see his presence, we say it. We say something. Say, that is Jesus at work among us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that Jesus came to be among us, that he came to be a baby boy, that he came to live a perfect life, die and rise again. Thank you that, uh, thank you Jesus, that you're still at work among us today, that your presence is still felt. Your presence is still seen and heard. Your presence and your work is still at work among us. We thank you. Father, would you direct our eyes towards you? Would you uh, show us a Bible verse that we can pray that sets our eyes towards you so that when we wait, it's waiting for you. We expect you. We want you to show up. Help us to wait for you. The Holy Spirit, direct our eyes. Help us to see when Jesus is at work so that we can tell other people, so we can highlight it to ourselves and others. We can say something when we see you at work. We ask, too, that you would be at work among us. Help us to be a people that wait for you. Because there's no God besides you that acts for those who wait for him. Where we can meet you, where we can see you at work in our lives, help us to highlight it. Help us to be a people that wait for you. I pray this blessing on everybody here. And I praise you in Jesus' name. Turn. Mm-hmm.